Well, good afternoon, and welcome to Christ Redeemer Quincy. My name is Matt Owens. I am the pastor here. Uh, and welcome for those of you who are in person and for those of you who are joining us online. If you are here in person, uh, we would ask for uh, you to observe uh, some safety uh, precautions, just spreading out, uh, keeping masks on. There's hand sanitizer on the back table. Uh, restrooms are to my left, up one flight of stairs. Uh, you can wash your hands there as well. Um, on the back table, when you're coming in, you'll find information about our children's ministry, Christ the Redeemer Kids. Uh, there are slips that you can fill out to uh, give us prayer requests, and we would love to be able to pray for you. Uh, or if you're visiting, you can fill that out to give us your information. Uh, and in that box, you can also place your offering if you're so inclined. Uh, but as we prepare to uh, come into the Lord's presence for worship, we just want to take a few moments uh, of silent meditation to uh, reflect, pray, meditate. There's going to be a meditation up here on the screen. Uh, and then I'll lead us in a call to worship in just a moment. you to stand for a call to worship. The Lord, by his word, calls us to worship him this afternoon. Now hear uh, his word, and if you would, participate by responding in the bold print from Isaiah chapter 55. Let us worship God for whom our souls thirst and our bodies long. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, so your word, O Lord, will not return empty but will accomplish its holy purpose. Then we will come into your presence with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Please remain standing as we join in the song of all creation in singing to our God.
Good afternoon, church. Uh, my name is Nick Pruitt. I'm a member here at uh, Christ the Redeemer, and uh, we welcome you today. Uh, if you would, let's uh, pray together uh, as the body of Christ. Father, we come before you today um, with open hands, with open hearts, uh, for the word that you have for us. And Father, we praise you for this time of the year that we're about to enter, where we are reminded that you came down here to this earth um, to walk amongst us and to redeem us. And Father, we just praise you that you are the Emmanuel, uh, that you are God with us. And so I pray for this church, for those that are here today, that you continually remind us and help us to live in that uh, truth that you are with us. You are walking with us in our daily lives, in our vocations, in the, the work that we do uh, on a daily basis. You are with us. Father, I pray for your presence, for your peace, for the families uh, that are represented in this church and then the extended families um, that uh, emanate from uh, these people who meet here today. I pray your blessing on our families uh, and teach us to um, to love and to um, pursue Christ uh, within our families. Father, I also pray that we uh, represent and reflect you as the God who's with us in Quincy here in greater Boston and also in the state of Massachusetts, Father. Uh, we have um, many needs, many injustices, um, many people who are suffering uh, and who need your saving grace and help us to reflect uh, your light and your presence in this world. Father, I lift up our nation to you. Uh, we are uh, in the midst of multiple trials, whether that be the pandemic or unstable politics. And Father, um, we pray that you are with us uh, and that you bring justice, healing, and restoration to this land. And finally, Father, I lift up this church. Help us to uh, rest in your presence. Um, once again, with the fact that you are Emmanuel and uh, continually remind us of your calling and the fact that you are beckoning us to the work that you are already um, fulfilling here um, in this community. And Father, as a church, may we forever pray uh, the words uh, that Christ gave um, us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is now a time of of the service where we uh, come before God uh, and uh, confess that we are sinners, uh, that we are incomplete without his grace, without his love that he gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, And so what we would like to do now is to take a few moments um, and in your pew, please uh, come before the Lord, confess your sins, uh, call upon his grace, and uh, generally we encourage you to change your posture in some way, but as just a a reflection, a testament of your acknowledgement of his presence, of his um, power and glory, and the fact that we fall short without Christ's grace. So Uh, Take a few moments, and then I'll bring us back together, and we will uh, walk through the assurance of grace. Let us now um, look to that assurance of grace we have in Christ Jesus. Uh, And so I'll read the passages that are for the leader, and then if you will follow along in the bold print. But our assurance of grace today is based from uh, uh, the passage of Revelation uh, chapter 5, and verses 5 and 9 through 10. So weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, for he was slain, And with his blood he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. To those who repent and look to Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, the forgiveness of sins is freely given in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. All right, would you please stand now as we continue uh, worshiping our Lord. Jesus died my soul to 
You may be seated. Uh, this is a, a time where I would like to share some of our announcements uh, in our church community. Uh, and these are great opportunities to be the church uh, and to fellowship together uh, outside of our kind of congregational worship on Sunday afternoons. Um, the only thing we do have on Sunday afternoons uh, is we have time for our children down in the fellowship hall. And so our children's minister, Kara Whitaker, uh, uh, does have um, a lesson and some activities planned for our children. And, and so after uh, this portion of the announcements and our new members kind of orientation, uh, we'll then release the children to go downstairs. Uh, we just ask that children below the age of six uh, that uh, a parent accompany them downstairs, but any children six or older uh, do not need to have a parent uh, come down there with them. Also, every Tuesday night, uh, we have the wonderful opportunity to get together, um, even if it is over Zoom in the midst of COVID, but uh, we have what's called community group, and this is a time where we meet uh, and go through scripture together, and uh, also just kind of, we, I, my favorite part is at the very beginning, just kind of sharing our day, about our lives, and usually there's a good icebreaker question involved. Um, but then we dig into scripture, and we've been going through the story of the Bible, uh, and we are where are we, Matt, now? Is it? Where are we? Esther. Esther, okay, yeah. So we're making good progress to the Old Testament, and we've been at this for, I feel like, over a year now. Um, but uh, it's a good time for us to dip into one book of the Bible and understand its context, uh, its framework, and, yeah, to dig a little deeper. And it's just a good time to kind of reconvene uh, as members of the church. A couple of other announcements tonight uh, at 7 o'clock. There is a congregational meeting for the larger Christ the King community. And so uh, this is Christ the King Boston is a network of churches that we also are a part of here at Christ the Redeemer. Uh, and there's going to be a congregational wide meeting tonight. Uh, and there will be a discussion of Christ the King's five year vision plan. Uh, and you'll also be hearing some updates from various congregations uh, within the network of Christ the King. So that's at seven tonight. I believe there's also early prayer at 6.30 if you're interested, uh, but they have more information on the Christ the King website. And then two uh, more local reminders. One is uh, this Friday uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we are looking for three to four people to volunteer. Uh, we are going to work with Union Congregational, who owns this building. Uh, we're going to work with some of their people, and we're going to, to decorate the sanctuary for the Advent Christmas season. And so if you're available at 2 o'clock uh, Friday afternoon, I let Matt know, and we're, yeah, I'm going to try to be here. Nothing better than hanging up greenery. Uh, and then one last announcement is that we will also be looking at holding a joint service with Union Congregational, um, uh, with their people, uh, on Christmas Eve. And we're looking at having a Christmas Eve service beginning at 5 o'clock uh, on the 24th um, with our church and Union Congregational that also meets here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt now. Okay, we get to do something uh, very significant, very special this afternoon, and 
receive new members. Uh, so uh, if I could ask to come up to the front, uh, the Costa family, Adnir, Joanna, uh, Asif, uh, Kyle Murphy, uh, Sam Ng, can you come over? And Naomi Owens and Liam and Nick Pruitt. We had a few others who um, went through the process and unfortunately aren't able to uh, be here. So hopefully we'll do this again sometime soon in January. If you want more info, you can, can talk to me about it. Uh, but these people that you see on stage, uh, except for those who are still coming, are, um, are doing something kind of countercultural. Um, now, I should say that some of the people that are on stage are already members of Christ the King Boston, um, but they haven't been received. Uh, you, you haven't, um, the, the, the practice that we've had at Christ the King is when somebody switches congregations, uh, they, they are recognized publicly and they go through the vows. And so some of the people are already members. Some are actually joining Christ the King Boston. Uh, but this is something countercultural, which is uh, to make a commitment uh, to something, uh, especially to a church, and to do so in a way, in a way that in no way did I, I hound anybody to make this commitment. Um, it's actually been a real blessing for me uh, over the last couple weeks as I interviewed people and got to hear their stories and saw people who uh, got emotional telling me about uh, what Jesus meant to them and what the church meant to them. Uh, that's not a requirement. You don't have to get emotional in order to join the church. Um, but but it, is, uh, uh, it was really encouraging for me. Um, and so this is, a, in many ways, a mutual commitment. Uh, they are making a commitment to this church body. And the church is making a commitment to their well-being and their flourishing and their sanctification as well. Um, and so they are joining, through Christ the Redeemer, uh, Christ the King Boston, uh, they'll be received, officially voted on this, uh, by the session uh, next month. Uh, and that includes, uh, in our polity, uh, those who are, um, are children of believers. And so uh, you see a couple children up here. They won't actually take the vows, but they are included, we believe, in the covenant that applies to God's people. And so they're, they're for the time, what we'll call non-communing members, until that they, they can make a profession of faith themselves uh, and, and take communion and actually be a, a communing member of the church. And so with that being said, uh, I'm gonna, I've got the vows. The, uh, these are the vows of the Presbyterian Church in America. And I will um, go through them one by one. And if you can affirm them, uh, please respond by saying together, yes. All right, first, do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, except through his sovereign mercy, do you? Yes. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and trust him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel, do you? Yes. Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? Do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? Yes. All right, amen. Well, let me, let me pray. Lord, we are thankful uh, that you are building your church uh, and even a pandemic can't stop it. Lord, that you have called uh, these people to yourself, uh, that you will call many more to yourself. I pray that you would use these people. You have uh, uniquely uh, gifted them uh, to serve in the church uh, and to bless uh, the church and to bless those who are outside the church. And so I, I pray, Lord, uh, that your hand would be upon uh, each and every life here. And I pray, Lord, that your uh, hand would continue to be upon us uh, corporately, uh, as we seek your face and as we seek the mission uh, in Quincy for which you've called us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now uh, the children are uh, dismissed to go downstairs and to do an activity and, and have a lesson. Um, and so let me pray for the children. I'll pray again as they depart from us. 
Uh, and and this, it's up to you. If, if uh, you have children six or above, they're welcome to go without a parent. If children are um, below that, then we ask that a parent accompany them downstairs. Um, but let me pray for our children as they depart. Lord, uh, we're so thankful for uh, the blessing of these children. We pray, Lord, that uh, they would not uh, know a day where they didn't uh, believe and love your word, uh, that they would uh, love you through it. And we pray, Lord, for uh, Kara and for the other teachers, uh, that they would teach and represent uh, to them truly uh, the truth of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, and as they depart, I'd ask you to stand for our next song. scripture reading is from 1st Samuel chapter 15 verses 1 through 31 and Samuel said to Saul the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel now therefore listen to the words of the Lord 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the, in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people shared a, spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not uh, utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me, and he has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told, it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on, and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to the destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as in iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul 
and Saul bowed before the Lord. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, well, hello again. Thank you, Naomi. This is the uh, conclusion of the first half of our First Samuel series. Uh, we'll conclude with this lighthearted story. Um, and we'll return to First Samuel next fall. Uh, but we're actually beginning an Advent series tomorrow in the first couple chapters of Luke's Gospel. Uh, starting next week, we'll, we'll pick up with Luke's Gospel then after the new year uh, and be there for a while. And I, I may explain, I didn't prepare, but I may explain... Uh, more of kind of the structure of uh, our preaching uh, schedule uh, next week. But uh, for now, uh, would you join me in prayer before we look at this, uh, this difficult text? Father, I pray um, that uh, we would come before you with a, a posture of openness, receiving uh, listening, would our hearts be open to, uh, to what you have for us? Would your spirit uh, speak words of truth and life to our hearts uh, by your word? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the early centuries of the Roman Empire, when a Roman emperor would ride into Rome in triumph, uh, there was a man designated to stand behind the emperor and constantly say, in his ear, you are a man. As if to say, though the people all around you cheer for you and exalt you, you are only a man. In many ways, Samuel is that voice for Saul. Samuel speaks the words of the Lord to the king, uh, reminding him that though he is king, he's only a man. Dependent on the Lord, and apart from the Lord, he's nobody. There's no other nation in which the king had to humble himself before his God like in Israel. In every other kingdom, the gods essentially bowed to the will of the king. Because those gods weren't real, the king could make them say whatever he chose. But in Israel, the living God will not bow to a man. Israel's king, then, must humbly listen to God's commands and obey. These two words, listen and obey, two words that are, are frequently in the uh, vocabulary of anyone, any parent with a three-year-old, uh, but are actually one word in Hebrew, uh, the verb shema, used eight times in this passage. As one commentator put it, in this passage, Listening is everything. And listening is intertwined with uh, another verb that sounds similar in Hebrew. Samuel says in verse 1, The Lord sent me to anoint you king. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. The anointed king is to listen and obey. Where there is no Shema, listening, there is no Meshach, anointing. Should the king fail to listen and obey God's word, he will forfeit his crown and his throne. For God's true king will humbly listen and obey the Lord. So as we move through this story, we're, we'll look at three things. First, the failure of a king. Second, the rejection of a king. And third, the humble obedience of the king. First, the failure of a king. It was an ancient injustice that the Lord called Saul to avenge in verses 2 and 3. Exodus 17 recounts how the Amalekites had attacked God's people shortly after the Lord had dried up the sea and led them out of Egypt. And as they fought, Israel prevailed when Moses held up his hands. And eventually he needed others to help hold them up. At the end of the battle... The Lord told Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Verse 16, the Lord 
will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So now, 300 years later, the Lord, through Samuel, instructs Saul to destroy the Amalekites. Man, woman, child, animal. So that there is nothing left. This is disturbing to us. Uh, It sounds an awful lot like ethnic cleansing. So how should we understand this command? Four things uh, to consider here. First, the Lord has judged the Amalekites that in their violent and evil ways, uh, his judgment would not delay until after death, as would normally be the case, but he would bring his judgment on them through the people of Israel immediately. The way one commentator put it, uh, this is not ethnic cleansing, but ethical cleansing. The Bible consistently shows that we all deserve this judgment. Uh, It should be alarming, but it doesn't mean that it's unfair. He uses Israel as an agent of his judgment on Amalek here, and later In the biblical story, he will use other nations as an agent of judgment on Israel. Second, the Bible was written in a uh, context far less individualistic than our own. Perhaps there's never been a society as individualistic as our own. And blessings or curses being applied to a corporate entity, a people or a tribe, uh, makes much greater sense in other cultures. We can't fully understand the gospel without an understanding of both corporate guilt and corporate righteousness. Uh, As Romans 5 says regarding Adam and Jesus, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Third, if these people remain in the land... Their violent and idolatrous practices would be mixed in with Israel's religion and society, and God's people and kingdom would be perverted. This happens frequently uh, throughout the Old Testament. And fourth, if we understand these events in light of the larger story of the Bible, we recognize that these events are part of a larger, cosmic, spiritual battle. There are spiritual forces of evil Uh, throughout the Bible, including in the Old Testament, seeking to thwart God's plan to establish his kingdom on earth because God's plan meant revealing his glory to the nations, the ultimate coming of the Savior King of the world. And so there's something very specific about this stage in redemptive history that does not transfer to today. It's unique to this place and time and people. There are several indications that there's something particularly sinister going on with the Amalekites. We see in in Deuteronomy 25 as well. Warnings that they would continue to wage war on God's people and that God's people should never forget. The Amalekites in the Old Testament and in in later Jewish writings uh, are almost the embodiment of cosmic evil. Haman, uh, who later seeks to destroy the Jews in the book of Esther, is an Amalekite, a descendant of King Agag, who Saul uh, does not kill. And to this day, uh, Jews refer to those who violently oppose the Jewish nation. I came across this in the writings of Elie Wiesel. Uh, They're referred to as Amalekites, people like Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad of Iran. And so, given these reasons, the Lord commands what only he, The only wise one who knows all human hearts has the right to command that they all be destroyed. Those are a few reasons, but at the end of the day, we have to concede that we just don't know all of God's reasoning. And we are not the ultimate judge. As William Cooper put it in his hymn, Uh, God moves in a mysterious way. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. And yet, judging God is all too common. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called God in the Dock, in which he writes that the ancient man approached God, or, or gods, 
as the accused person approaches his judge. But for the modern man, he says, the roles are reversed. He, man, is the judge. And God is in the dock. In other words, God is the one on trial. But we are not to judge God, nor do we decide uh, which of his commands we keep and which ones throw out. To live as a Christian means to come under the authority of a greater king. And that means listening and obeying, which is not always easy, especially when we don't understand or when with the knowledge that we do have, we don't agree. But we must not set ourselves over God and his word. For that's what gets Saul in trouble here. He's placed himself over God's word as the higher authority, which is exactly what God's king was not to do. Because the Lord is king, and he will not be a consultant. He is the judge, not the defendant. And so what does Saul do with this command? What we see in verses uh, 4 through 8, he takes a massive army, and then he soundly defeats the Amalekites and devoted to destruction all the people. But verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the fattened calves, all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. He fails to listen and obey, not because he's this great humanitarian. He kills that which he deems worthless. His objections uh, to God's commands are not the same as what ours would be. And we see the Lord's response to Samuel in verse 10, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And we see Samuel's response. He takes no pleasure in Saul's failure. He's angry and cries out to the Lord all night. After little sleep, Samuel rises early to bring Saul the word of the Lord. And in verse 13, Saul greets him enthusiastically, saying, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Saul immediately says, Then what is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear. You see, Saul's failure to listen was obvious by Samuel simply listening. He listened, and he heard the sounds of Saul's disobedience, these animal noises. So that is the failure of a king. Let's look next at the rejection of a king. How would Saul respond? What, we, what we'll see is what follows are a number of self-justifying excuses. We often believe that excuses will minimize our sin, but they actually make them worse. And if we're honest, Saul's uh, self-justifications here are uh, familiar to us. They hit, they hit home. First, he blames others. Isn't this the uh, universal excuse, starting with Adam and Eve in the garden? When Samuel calls him out about the livestock, Saul says, Ah, verse 15, they have brought them from the Am Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Throughout this conversation between Saul and Samuel, Saul distances himself from guilt. If we go back to verse 9, we read, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, etc. But when Saul tells the story, his own name drops off. And it becomes simply, the people spared. Samuel confronts this in verse 17. He says, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. In other words, you're the king, which means you don't have the authority to disobey the Lord, but you do have authority over the people. The people on whom you're casting blame for your lack of obedience. His second uh, self-justification is, I did it for God. 
Saul explains that they saved the animals to offer as a sacrifice. There's actually no indication uh, that this is why they were spared. But this sounds much more pious than we wanted the best for ourselves. Well, Samuel doesn't buy his explanation. He indicates in verse 19 that Saul eagerly, greedily kept what he wanted. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul's essentially saying here uh, that he disobeyed the Lord for the Lord, uh, which really doesn't make any sense. When Saul reiterates this self-justification, Samuel poses a question in verse 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And then he explains a principle that we see throughout the scriptures, especially in the Psalms and the prophets. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. No formal worship practices, no amount of uh, reciting prayers or going through certain rites can make up for disobedience, unrighteousness. The Lord is interested in perfect righteousness alone. Third, it just seemed more sensible to Saul. It just seemed more sensible to keep the animals, not let them go to waste, though they, they were actually being devoted, consecrated to the Lord. Uh, and it's when God's word does not make sense to us that we discover uh, what we really obey, God's ways or our ways, that we discover what we really worship, God or ourselves or, or something else. This is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Trust in the Lord out. with all your heart and lean not in your own, on your own understanding. Our, our own understanding often leads us astray. And the last thing, uh, Saul seeks to justify himself by the good that he has done. Verse 20, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But God is not impressed with what we've done or uh, the sins that we've abstained from. He's only impressed by perfect righteousness. And self-righteousness is always comparative. And so Saul doubles down on blaming the people, saying, I'm better than them. Verse 21, but the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And that one word that Saul uses did you catch it, speaks volumes about where he is with the Lord. He says, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He actually does this twice in the passage. He used the exact same phrase in verse 15, indicating that uh, this was not accidental. He doesn't say, our God or my God. He says, your God. Saul appears to have placed himself outside the sphere of, of God's reign. And this perhaps suggests why he, so, he seems so unable to listen and obey the Lord. Uh, Rachel Gilson in uh, Christianity Today a couple years ago wrote an article where she, she put it like this, the obedience of faith only works when it's rooted in a person, not a rule. Imposed on its own, a rule invites us to sit in judgment, weighing its reasonableness. But a rule flowing from a relationship smooths the way for faithful obedience. When a child doesn't understand her mother's command, the mother's character plays a strong role in what happens next. A cruel, capricious mother is likely to meet resistance, but an affectionate, nurturing mother inspires trust because you know she's on your side profoundly. And she goes on to talk about why Abraham was able to follow God into the unthinkable. He trusted God because he knew God. And because he knew God, he knew that he was trustworthy. Do you know God as trustworthy? Do you know God? Saul seems 
not to know the Lord or his trustworthiness. Samuel tells him, verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. It's only when he says this that Saul finally stops making excuses and confesses. Verse 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Even in his confession, though, he presents himself as a sort of victim. He uses a a softer word, transgressed. It's like he's saying, okay, I've sinned. I've passed over. I've overlooked God's commandment because I was afraid of the people. But now that I've confessed, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. Samuel reiterates the message of his rejection in verse 26. And as Samuel turns to leave, Saul makes a final desperate attempt. He dives at him and he tears his robe. Samuel, the prophet, sees it as a picture that the Lord has torn from Saul the kingdom and given it to his neighbor who is better. In the short term, he's talking about David. Now, that may raise some red flags. I mean, in many ways, David's sins look worse than Saul's. David commits adultery and arranges to have an innocent man murdered to cover up his sin. But though his sins may be worse than Saul's, his repentance is much more sincere. When David is confronted, he repents sincerely. Rather than seeking to justify himself, he has a contrite heart. And one of the major themes of of this first Samuel that we've been going through from the very beginning is that man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Saul is rejected, but his reign is far from over. And for the rest of it, we see Saul's heart turn increasingly wicked, doing anything he can to hold on to power, seek to kill his rivals, demonstrating the rightness of the Lord's judgments. It's kind of like when a young woman uh, breaks up with a boyfriend because she's shown some signs of uh, anger or cruelty or being manipulative. Uh, And after she breaks up with him, then he snaps and he says and does extremely cruel things and is manipulative and proves her right so that she knows that without a doubt that she uh, made the right decision. Well, that's how Saul is for the rest of his kingship. He proves the Lord right. Samuel says to Saul in verse 29, the glory of Israel, that is the Lord, will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. And you say, wait a minute, Uh, what about verse 11? Uh, Which says, the Lord regretted that he made Samuel king. The Lord says, I regret making Saul king. Uh, sorry, that he made Saul king. The Lord says, I regret making Saul king. But we have to read the rest of the verse. For he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. The Lord did not change. His commitment to his people did not change. Saul changed. Saul's early success as a king came when he humbly placed himself under the authority of God when he listened to his word. But should he ever fail to listen and obey, then for the sake of God's people, his plan, his promises, he will no longer allow Saul as his anointed king. Salvation is not conditional on obedience, but being the king of God's people is. God's true anointed king will humbly listen and obey. And so let's look now at the humility or or the humble obedience of the king. 1 Samuel began with the principle uh, in Hannah's song, if you can remember back to our first week, that the Lord brings low and he exalts. As it's stated in the New Testament, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And this is what's taking place here. God's bringing down the mighty Saul and giving the kingdom to a humble shepherd boy that he's raising up, a man after his own heart. He's given Saul several chances to repent, and ultimately it's Saul's lack of repentance uh, is rooted in his lack of humility. 
Yes, Saul, Samuel says in verse 17 that Saul is little in his own eyes, but he indicates that this is a false humility. As has been said before, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And because Saul seems completely unable to think about anything but himself, he's unable to hear God's word and repent. For true repentance is turning from ourselves or, or from whatever we've centered our lives on back to the Lord, listening to his voice above our own, above our neighbors. A repentant person is a listening person. Only when we're humble are we able to truly hear, to listen to God's word. And so God is gracious when he removes our pride, our selfish ambition, our idols from the center of our life and identity so that we may listen, though it will always be uncomfortable and painful for him to do so. One of my friends from seminary uh, once told me of a dream that he had as he was actually preparing to preach on this very passage. And in the dream he was preaching, uh, but he was raised way up high on a podium like they used to preach uh, in the Puritan days. So he's preaching down at the temple. And if, as I explain this dream, maybe you'll understand why I don't want to preach up there. Um, but he described then, as he was preaching, the walls opening up and suddenly they were outside. And looking off into the distance, he saw this massive wave coming. But it wasn't a wave of water. It was red. It was a wave of blood. And he said he felt this urge to get down lower. For though he knew that it would be uncomfortable to be enveloped in this wall of blood, he, he, he knew that he needed to get lower so that the wave of blood would wash over him too. And this is what he took from the dream, his conclusion. He said, we must not put ourselves on a pedestal. We must never find ourselves above looking down on the cross, but always below it. We must never be above God's word, but always under it. Throughout the pages of scripture, if God is going to truly use someone, then he's going to humble them. He gives Jacob a mark, a laming, a reminder of his weakness and constant dependence on the Lord. He takes Saul in the New Testament and renames him Paul, meaning small one or humble one, and gives him a thorn in his side. A thorn that, as Paul says, it was there to keep him from becoming conceited. If the Lord is going to use someone, then he will be gracious to humble them, that they may listen. Charles Spurgeon once said, there are two kinds of Christians, the humble and the humbled. David Martin Lloyd-Jones tells the story of when he was a young man being in a room uh, with a group of older Welsh ministers. Uh, and there was this other Welsh, there was this young Welsh preacher uh, who had just come on the scene and was extremely gifted, and he was drawing great crowds to hear him preach. And all these old Welsh preachers uh, praised his abilities, his gifts. But then one of them said in Welsh, but I'm not sure that he's been humbled yet. And the rest of them kind of nodded knowingly. And Lloyd-Jones concludes, how can a man remain what he was when he's been near God. This is very much my own experience. Uh, my final semester in seminary is a time that I look back on as a sort of humbling, as a sort of chemotherapy for my pride, uh, which is not to say that the cancer of pride uh, can never return. But God used a particular set of difficult circumstances in my life, including uh, a breakup, to break my heart and to break my pride. As uh, this young woman told a friend, not me, but I found out, uh, of, of my arrogance. And I told a friend later, as the Lord was dealing with my arrogance, uh, and I believe this to this day, that God raised up this young woman in my life for the purpose of bringing me low, 
of humbling me. And as a result of being humbled, I remember uh, being able to listen and hear God's word in a way that I never had before. I, I remember being constantly overwhelmed with emotion and on the verge of tears nearly every time I heard the Bible read, which was a lot because I was in seminary studying the Bible, so it was really awkward. But it seemed to me uh, that though I had heard God's word before, in that period of, of my life, it seemed like every word was an arrow straight to my heart. I received God's word because uh, it was like receiving it through an open wound. I was listening, I was open in a way that I, I never had been before, uh, and perhaps since. God humbles his servants that we may listen, that we might hear his word. And his word is saying to us, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's Psalm 95 uh, applied in Hebrews 3. Failures, hardships, suffering, these things can either Harden our hearts like with Saul. He's our cautionary tale. Or these things can soften our hearts to be open, receptive to God's voice. What makes the difference? What, soften our hearts, what softens our hearts to listen to his word? We must let our failures, our weakness, all of what humbles us, drive us like a nail to his love, to borrow a, a phrase from Tim Keller. And this may be very unpleasant. As Miroslav Volf puts it, the wrongly centered self needs to be decentered by being nailed to the cross. The way Paul puts it in Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That is why Paul can boast in his weakness, because it's our weakness that drives us to the foot of the cross where we are humbled by both the magnitude of our own sins for which Jesus is crucified and for the magnitude of his unimaginable love for us. Jesus is the true king who humbly listens and obeys. He lives Every, he lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are saved by his perfect obedience. I said earlier that God is impressed uh, only by perfect righteousness, which we don't possess on our own. But Christ's perfect righteousness is ours when we are united to him by faith. That is the good news. In the face of death, in the face of suffering, in the face of sorrow, we hum he humbly, obediently submitted himself to his Father's will. He did not make excuses like Saul. Jesus had the ultimate excuse. He was God. And what God would submit himself to suffer? What king would voluntarily forfeit his crown and throne for a crown of thorns? But he did not use his divinity as an excuse, as something to exempt him from suffering. Rather, he emptied himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He trusted his father to death and beyond. God's kingdom is in the hands of one so much better than Saul, much better than any of us, God's kingdom is in the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. So may we humbly listen and obey as we follow him on a road that leads continually back to the cross where we find our true, obedient, humble king. But we follow him through the cross where we find on the other side resurrection, glory, where we find our crucified yet risen King reigning forever. Would you pray with me?
Father, would you use uh, your word and would you use your sacrament uh, to uh, allow us to listen, to receive, uh, even if we're receiving through a, a wound. Uh, because what we receive from you uh, is that which gives us life. So, Lord, we need your grace to even uh, know that we need your grace. But would we know that we need it? And, Lord, would you be gracious to give it? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the grace upon grace is that the Lord knows, the Lord knew (laughs) that we uh, would be hard-hearted, that we, that he would need to do uh, multiple things to get us to listen, that we could listen audibly uh, to his word, but we also need to tangibly experience it. We need to taste and see his goodness as we do in the sacrament of communion. If you are uh, here visiting with us and, or, or you're a member of this church and you have placed your faith in Christ, uh, either way, if you place your faith in Christ, you are warmly welcome to partake of uh, communion with us. Uh, if that's not you, if, you don't, uh, if you're not sure that you believe this gospel that I've uh, talked about, or you're sure that you don't believe it. Uh, This is not a first step to faith, so we would ask that you allow uh, these elements to pass you by. For those who are uh, coming uh, and receiving communion, uh, we will pray responsively together uh, the words of the great prayer of thanksgiving, which can be found on the screen. If you would, please respond with the bold print. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we give thanks to you, Jesus Christ, for by your life, death, and resurrection you have given to us true and eternal life. Therefore we join our voices with all of your people and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us now boldly proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. In just a moment, I'll put my mask on and I'll come around. If you would, slide to uh, either the inside or the outside of the aisles, keeping your mask on. Um, And then if you would, take off the tray uh, one cup per person that's taking. There is both a wafer and juice inside the cup. Uh, You can open uh, the first seal and find the wafer and the second seal to find the juice. Um, And if you would, hold on to that. Uh, so that we can wait to partake together as a sign of our unity in Christ. I'll come back up here and I'll lead us through that. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On the same night after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I would invite you to taste and see that the Lord is good.
The body of Christ broken for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. Would you pray with me? Lord, we want to be a uh, humble people who receive your word, who uh, submit to it and listen. So would you write these things on our hearts? Would you use these common elements um, for holy use to nourish our faith, to strengthen us, to go out and live as your people, representing Christ uh, to a world that so desperately needs to see his light and love and truth? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would now please stand for our closing song.
Lord called us by his word into his presence to worship him this afternoon. Now hear his word, this good word, this benediction, as he sends you out to love and to serve him this week. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace.